What I'd like to do is talk about our responsibility when it comes to our sexual sin because there's a lot of us that kind of think, well, I'll be sexually pure just as soon as God does the work. And um, there's a kind of a give and take when it comes to our responsibility, when it comes to our sexual sin between God and us. The other thing I want to talk about is our first main vulnerability when it comes to our sexual sin, which would be our eyes and our mind. Okay, that's, that's the gate through which a lot of our lust and a lot of our sexual sin enters into us, into our spirit, into our soul. And so I want to um, talk about how to defend that. But the first thing I want to do, as I said, is just talk about our responsibility. I was in uh, Mexico City not too long ago, and um, kind of a big event, and there were some reporters there, and they, one of them stood up and kind of challenged me and asked me this question, who do you think you are coming down into our culture talking about sexual purity. We are hot-blooded, we are sensual. That's just the way Latinos are, okay? Now let me ask you a pair of questions in light of that question. If your culture has always been a certain way sexually, does that mean that you have no further responsibility for your sexual actions and that you can ignore scripture? Uh, in other words, does God give Latinos a pass because, hey, he created them hot-blooded, right? And he sits up there talking to Gabriel and saying, man, if I would have just not given him such hot blood, they could be pure too. Okay? Or is it this way? If your culture has been sensual for years, okay, are you responsible to separate that culture from your own life and from your own mind and live a different way from those around you? That's an important question, you see, because your cultural beliefs are man's way of thinking. And man's way of thinking will abort the purification process in your life every time because it just leads to mixture. Okay? In this reporter's case, for instance, he had the mixture of the Latino mind and the Christian mind. In my case, I once had the mixture of the American mind with the Christian mind. But the truth is, if I desire the mind of Christ, I have to get the American mind out of my head completely, or I'm never going to align with Christ. Let me give you an example why. What is the American mind? Well, this is what American men say. Hey, looking and lusting is just guys being guys. There's no problem with that. God wouldn't have made women this beautiful if he didn't want us to look at them. I mean, looking at women and kind of lusting, that's no different than being in a museum and appreciating fine art. Okay. How about this one? Why worry about what I look at? The blood covers it all anyway. I'm fine. I'm going to heaven. How about this one? Porn is just pictures on paper. What are you talking about? Nothing I do in the privacy of my home hurts anyone. Okay. Now, as long as I believe stuff like that, I'm never going to be pure ever. It's just never going to happen. So what I'm saying is we need to be very careful how much of our culture is in our thinking when it comes to our sexuality. Let me give you a few more examples. Um, at that same event, I was talking to a reporter from Colombia, and uh, she had some very interesting things to say about her culture. She says it's common for parents to take their sons to prostitutes at age 14 to teach them about sex, to teach them about love. Also, it's expected of married men to have mistresses. In fact, it's a slap in the face of your wife if you don't have a mistress because it proves that you're kind of a dog and you can't get a, mis a mistress. And it makes her be married to a dog then and kind of takes her down a peg. If you have three or four maids to take care of your home, it is literally expected that you will be regularly having sex with them, all of them. When Christian men in Colombia are challenged regarding their purity, they have one of two responses, she told me. Hey, I'm a man, I'm built this way, there's not a thing I can do about it. Number two, I'm mature, I can watch R-rated movies, it doesn't hurt me at all. Let me give you another example. When I was in Costa Rica recently, I just happened to be there at the time when Focus on the Family released survey results uh, on married evangelical men. They had surveyed 300 evangelical Christian men and they had asked this question, have you ever had an affair? a physical affair outside your marriage. 299 out of 300 Christian men said, yes, I've had an affair outside of marriage. And I was told by some of my friends there that that's just part of the culture. 
What is expected of us as Christian men when we're raised in cultures like Mexico, like Costa Rica, like Colombia, like America, okay? Are we responsible for our sexual purity if we're raised there? Okay, what about you as men? Are you responsible for your sexual purity? Or can you simply say, I'm a man, I'm built this way, and besides my culture's this way, this is the way we are? What about your sons, if you're a father? Do you just say, I guess I'll just take him to a prostitute to teach him about sex, or I will give him Playboy magazines? Is that how we do it? Or, and, and are we limited to that because, hey, our son's a guy just like us, he's built that way, there's nothing he can do? Or do we take steps to help them defend themselves? Well, you see, Colombians would answer one way, Mexicans would answer another way, Costa Ricans another way, and Americans another way. Who's right? When it comes to sensuality and sexuality, what is normal for a Christian man? What's a Christian man supposed to look like? What's the normal look? Okay, who defines normal? That's the other question. Most of us are defining normal based upon our cultures. That Mexican uh, reporter, okay, He's saying Latinos are hot-blooded people. He's saying we're sensual. It's normal for our women to wear practically nothing. And it's expected that we as men are to appreciate that all through the day, no matter who they are. Okay? That's what he calls normal. He says it's common and everyone thinks this way. Now, we in America, we even in this room, okay, the same thing is true. Most of the people in this room regularly peek into other people's bedrooms to watch other couples having sex regularly. Now, we call that going to the movies. But the truth is, in America, it has become normal to be a peeping Tom and to look in and be a voyeur. Now, that's what we call normal. That's what we call common. Everyone thinks this way. It's okay. To not do that would be considered completely strange. So I would ask you this. As men, how are you defining normal? What is, what is it that you call normal? Is it the things that are common in the world? You see, God doesn't measure normal by what's common in the world. He doesn't measure normal in relation to the world at all. He measures normal in comparison to the word, not the world, the word. Okay, and he uses words like sin, which means missing the mark. Okay, he has a standard. What mark is that? Well, we're talking about the mark that was set by Jesus when he was here on this earth. He was the Word of God incarnate. Everything in the Word is him. He is the Word. Okay? And God speaks along these lines when it comes to normal. He doesn't say, whatever's common, that's normal. He says this, Jesus is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. He is the most normal person to have ever walked the face of the earth. Are you a Christian? If so, my child, are you walking normally like my son Jesus? All right. So as Christian men, we need to measure from that mark, okay? because becoming normal is what Christianity is all about. If we don't become normal like Jesus, we trample and hurt those around us, especially those that we want to love the most and that love us the most. So let's talk about normal for a moment measured by that mark. I'm going to blend some scriptures together into a couple of paragraphs so you can see what a normal Christian man should look like. Not a Christian Costa Rican, not a Christian Colombian or a Christian American. What a Christian should look like, a son of God. God says it's normal for a Christian man to keep his way pure, Psalms 119.9, and to set no vile thing before his eyes, Psalm 101.3. It is normal for a Christian to avoid lusting after girls, Job 31.1. It's normal to have not a trace of sexual immorality in your life, Ephesians 5.3. And, and normal conversations should have no trace of coarse language or filthy jokes, Ephesians 5.4. Normal guys don't leer at breasts or wink at each other with a low whistle as the babes prance by, and they don't rent Titanic so they can watch Kate Winslet drop her robe, and stretch nude across the couch. Okay. That's what normal is. Okay, In God's eyes, that is what all his sons should look like. Of course, that's not the way it is, but that is his standard of normal. 
Most of us aren't measuring from this mark. We are measuring from our culture, and we're allowing our culture to define normal Christian behavior for us. But if a man wanted to align himself with the word and to get the culture out of his mind, whose responsibility would it be? It could be argued that our holiness is 100% God's responsibility. After all, only God can author holiness in our lives, okay? First, he, he won the victory on the cross at Calvary. Uh, he has given us all the grace and power we need to win. And without that new life that he places in us at salvation, we would be completely helpless to chase after holiness. And, and there's a story I'd like to share that helps you to see just how real that is. When I got saved, within a couple of weeks, I had a job back in Iowa, and I immediately packed up and moved. God was trying to get me away from where I was, away from my old girlfriends, so I could have a fresh start. The interesting thing was, was I was on the way home, and I decided to stop in Colorado to visit a friend. His dad owned a ranch there, and uh, this ranch was big and I'd never really been to rodeos and he's going to show me a good time. So I was going to stop there, rest a few days before I started my new career. I had been driving a long time that day. When I got to his place, the first thing I said to him was, Hal, it's nice to see you, but where's the bathroom? I really had to go. And he said, well, it's down the hall to the left and, and you'll find it down there. So I went down the hall to the left and I walked towards the bathroom and as I got to the threshold, I stopped dead in my tracks completely repulsed. And what I saw was all the walls from top to bottom were wallpapered with Playboy type centerfolds. And I was just stunned, just repulsed. And you might say, well, of course you're, you should be repulsed. But you have to remember, I'm the guy that always saved the centerfold to the end of the magazine, kind of like dessert after a meal. I mean, I love centerfolds and here all of a sudden I'm just repulsed by it and that really took me off guard. And um, I didn't realize till later what was really happening there. You see, at that point in my Christian life, I'd only been a Christian for a couple of weeks, I had not read my Bible since I'd become a Christian. I had not memorized a hymn or sung hymns. I hadn't memorized scriptures. I hadn't done any of the things that we normally think of as Christian living or any kind of devotions. And yet, here I was walking into this room and my life had already begun to change. What was that? That was the new life of Christ that had been placed in me that was already working to draw me towards purity and I hadn't done a thing yet. Okay, so the reality of purity, the reality of the Holy Spirit drawing us towards purity and holiness and that he plays a big role of it became very clear to me in that instance. Now, <clears throat> what does the Bible say? That's a good story, and it was really clear there, but does the Bible say that God has the responsibility and has a really strong part in this? Absolutely. 2 Peter 1, 3 through 4. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him, so that through them and through His promises, you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Point is this, every Christian already has everything he needs to walk purely. I mean, God has a big responsibility, but he's already fulfilled his responsibility. And he continues to fulfill that responsibility by bringing people into situations like this, where you can learn about his word, learn about how to live the Christian life. He's constantly at work drawing us to holiness. But that begs a really important question, doesn't it? We know that most Christian men aren't pure, even though all of us have the power we need to be pure. Why aren't we all pure if we all have the power? It's because we can say no to the new life. When I was a new Christian, um, there were a lot of things I was learning. Uh, one of them was the fact that the Sabbath day is a day of rest. And um, I didn't know what that was supposed to look like, so I kind of created my own image of what a day of rest was. So what I would do every Sunday after church is I would come home and uh, I would, first of all, get out a frozen cheese pizza. I would layer it with frozen peas. 
and then I would shred fresh mozzarella on top of that. So I would have a double cheese and peas pizza. It was really good. I had it every Sunday. I would also, after baking that, get out my favorite beer, Henry Weinhardt's, and I would set that pizza in my lap. I would have the beer in my hand, a remote control in the other, and I would watch NFL football. That was my day of rest. And I thought that was really good. And I would do that week after week, and I enjoyed it like crazy until one day the Holy Spirit joined me uh, for my day of rest. And he came in and he said, why do you need that? And he wasn't referring to the double cheese and peas pizza. He was referring to that bottle of beer in my hand, and I knew it. And I started to stare at that bottle of beer. And I couldn't come up with an answer. I'm not sure why I need this. So after about five minutes, the game had become background noise, and I just got up, went to the kitchen. I poured out that bottle of beer into the kitchen sink, and then I opened up every bottle of beer in my apartment, and I poured those all out too. And I haven't had a drink of alcohol since. Now, what am I saying about this? My father asked me to do something, okay? And I knew why he asked me to do it. He knew, as well as I knew, that as long as I was drinking alcohol, I was never going to be sexually pure. Because when I'm drinking alcohol and when I'm with women, I don't care anything about my standards anymore. I'm just interested in seeing if I can get them in bed. That's just who I have always been. And what he was saying to me was, Fred, uh, I need you to stop drinking the alcohol so that you can be free. And uh, my response to him was, yes, Dad. Yes, Father. I'll do that. Okay? And as long as we keep saying yes to that new life in us, we're seeing yes to the things he requires of us, we keep growing in our mind of Christ, we keep moving into further, deeper alignment, and um, we have that, we become a spiritual person with that full mind of Christ. So it's very clear from that story, isn't it, that um, God isn't the only one with the responsibility here. He has given us the power, he's asked us to be pure, but we still have to respond and say yes. Okay. Now you might say, okay, well that's a, another good story, but does the Bible actually say that we have a responsibility for our purity? Because a lot of us don't want that responsibility. We'd rather have God do it because it's hard. The Bible does say that we have a responsibility. I'm going to just read a few snippets of the word to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. In Romans 6, 11 through 14, it says this, In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Now listen, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not let sin reign. Whose responsibility is that? Who's, who's this talking to? It's talking to you. Okay? He's not saying the Holy Spirit is not to do it. We are to choose not to do it. How about this one? 2 Peter 3, 11 through 14. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, it's talking about the end times, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That's a choice. Now listen. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. How do we become spotless, blameless, and at peace with him? Part of it is making every effort. We choose to make every effort to make that happen. How about this? 2 Corinthians 7, 7, 1. Since we have these promises, dear friends, let us, listen, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness, what? Out of reverence for God. Because of our love for Him, we choose to purify ourselves. We have a role in this process. And then one of my very favorites, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3-8, it is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality. That's a choice. That each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the heathen who do not know God. Each of you should learn to control. Okay, that's a choice you're making, to learn to control so that you align with Christ. 
So we absolutely do have a responsibility in holiness and we must choose to walk rightly. Now, you might say to yourself, okay, why do you make such a big deal about our responsibility? It's very critical because Satan's biggest weapon in this battle is to get you to believe that you don't have a responsibility. Okay? Because if he can get you to believe you don't have a responsibility, he doesn't have to do anything further because the very way your body is built will slide you right into sexual sin. The moment you don't put up defenses and you're living in a, sexual, a sensual sexual culture, you're naturally going to fall that way. Now, he wants you to believe you have no power, that you have no ability to resist, you have no place in the battle that's of any note, and you have no ability to flee. Men constantly crowd in their hearts. I'm a Christian. Why can't I win this thing? I should be able to win this thing. One of the things I want to talk about here is that parts of this problem are not really spiritual issues. Some of this battle for purity is a physical issue, and we need to recognize that for what it is. You see, we have two major vulnerabilities in our sexuality. We're going to talk about one right now, and it's this, that men can draw sexual gratification, good, real, true sexual gratification, through their eyes. All right? And truth is, if we don't defend our eyes, we're going to draw that sexual gratification naturally. And if we don't defend ourselves, we will slide into sexual sin just by nature. Now let me tell you about the science behind what I just said. Uh, a few years ago, um, Senator, uh, there, there were senators bringing a question in front of the United States Senate, and the question was this, should we continue to treat pornography as just another form of free speech, or should we consider pornography to be a drug like other drugs that needs to be uh, controlled, like other controlled substances? Um, that is a weird question to bring before the Senate because most United States citizens don't see pornography for what it really is. I mean, they don't, a drug? A controlled substance? What are you talking about? But see, that was the issue they wanted to talk about. And they wanted to bring in experts on brain studies, experts on pornography, just to kind of see what is really true one way or the other. And what was presented before the Senate was just awe-inspiring. Uh, Jeffrey Satinover made a statement that I have never been able to get over. I mean, it really started me on a, a long path of brain study and, and really learning about how the eyes and the brain work. Listen to what he said in front of the Senate. The eye is a very carefully designed delivery system for evoking a tremendous flood within the brain of endogenous opioids. Now, he's a scientist, so he uses big words. Let me just kind of break that down a carefully designed delivery system. What's a delivery system? Well, if we think in terms of like heroin, you always get the picture of a guy putting heroin in a syringe and mainlining it in his arm, and then, of course, the heroin's in his system, and he gets high. And the delivery system is that syringe. And what he's saying here is the eye works like a syringe of drugs, that when the eye looks at something sexual, it releases a syringe full, say, of pleasure chemicals into the pleasure centers of the mind called the limbic center, okay? Now, he said it evokes a tremendous flood, that's what I'm talking about, the drugs, a tremendous flood within the brain of endogenous opioids. Now, endogenous simply means um, chemicals that are just existing in your body naturally, they're there all the time, and what that sensuality does is it calls those and delivers those to the pleasure centers of the brain. Opioids, uh, the most common opioid we know is heroin, okay? That's a, a drug that's an opioid. So what he's saying is these drugs are strong too and they're addictive. Now listen to what he says. This is the sentence that I just couldn't believe. Modern science allows us to understand that the underlying nature of an addiction to porn is chemically nearly identical to heroin addiction. If you look at the two in brain studies and under the microscope and all that, the 
addiction to pornography is chemically nearly identical to a heroin addiction. Isn't that amazing? And if you think about the drugs that are involved, drugs like dopamine that hit the pleasure center, dopamine is considered to be uh, estimated 30 times stronger than cocaine. Uh, do you suspect that might be a little addictive? Yeah, I mean, drug lords all over the world are trying to find a way to synthesize dopamine because the day they can figure out a way to synthesize dopamine, we're all dead because that thing is so strong, it'll keep people addicted forever. So what we're talking about here is that the eyes are like a needle full of heroin. We are in a situation that we minimize what our eyes do. You know, oh, those are just little things, and you know, uh, people are just being picky if they say we shouldn't watch this or watch that. But the fact is, science shows us just the opposite, that it is something happening that's very strong. Mary, uh, Dr. Mary Ann Layden from Penn, the University of Pennsylvania, said that the pictures we look at are actually burned into the brain. That image, that porn image, is in your brain forever. If that were an addictive substance then, you at any point the rest of your life could in a nanosecond draw it up, view it in your mind, and get high. Have those pleasure chemicals come out. Okay? We know that it's the wash of pleasure chemicals that freezes those images in our mind. And I know, I can tell you right now, I can remember the picture, I can see it. Uh, Suzanne Summers standing in a waterfall uh, in a Playboy magazine totally nude. Okay? And, uh, I can pull that up when I want. I never do, except when I'm speaking and I have to, okay? The fact of the matter is, I could pick a lot of those pictures and draw them up because they're all there. Uh, so what we need to understand that this is not a small thing, what we're viewing and, and what we're thinking about, because it does get frozen in your mind. And I think most guys uh, know that implicitly because we've all experienced it. Let me tell you a story about my son, Michael. I mean, he's... Um, 21, 6'6", 300 pounds right now, but back then he was around 11, okay? And he was just kind of getting to the point where nearing puberty, but he wasn't quite there yet. And um, there was a book deadline I was working on, and, and uh, you know, it was, I think it was wintertime in Iowa, and so, you know, people get cabin fever, they want it out. So Brenda took my two girls and Michael out shopping at the mall just to get out of the house. Well, when they came back, I was in the basement. I could hear that they were having a good time. They were giggling, and I heard some packages hit the floor, which always means Brenda's happy, right? She bought something. And so uh, what happened is that uh, I heard the giggling kind of stop, and the girls run upstairs, and then there was silence. Now, I didn't know what was happening in the silence, but Brenda told me this story later. She said that she was just moving some things around in the kitchen and Michael came up and gave her a big hug around the thighs. That's about how tall he was, so gave her this big hug around the thighs. And she thought he was just thanking her for a fun day at the mall. So uh, she turned around and she looked him in the eye and she said, well, I love you too, Michael. And then he just froze on her eyes and he, and he said, Mom, how do you get pictures of women in their underwear out of your brain? Just out of the blue. And uh, she did like most wise Christian women would do. She said, I think that's a good question for your dad. Okay, she wanted no part of that question. But, and she did send him down to me to talk about that. But before she did, she asked him a question. And she said, son, what pictures of women in their underwear are you talking about? And he said, well, we were in the mall today. We were just walking along and we went by that secret store. Okay, everybody knows that's Victoria's Secret. He didn't know, he's 11 years old. You know, girls, what's that, you know? But he said, I walked by, I looked into that window, and ever since then I haven't been able to get those pictures out of my mind. What happened? Saw the lingerie, frozen in his mind, pleasure chemicals. He's only 11, but it still works, why? He's a guy. We are built that way. Now. What do these doctor statements in front of the Senate and Michael's story tell us about who we are? Number one, God created men this way, there's no question, and there's no reason to attach shame to it. The fact that we're visual, no reason to attach shame. The fact that we can get stuck that way, no reason to attach shame. Okay? Male sexuality is not deviant. 
It's just different from female sexuality. Did you know that the pleasure center in men is twice as large, the sexual pleasure center in men is twice as large as it is in women? Now we don't know what all that means except to say this, it's probably at the root of why we're more visual than they are. And we're going to find, the more we study the differences between men and women, we're going to find out why it is that these things work the way they do. But the big thing is, is there's nothing, there's no reason to attach shame to it. Number two, when we're stuck on, in sexual sin, it's not necessarily a reflection of our spiritual life, at least not at first. Okay. It's a reflection of maleness. My son Michael was 11. He wouldn't know a girl from a bale of hay, and he found girls boring at that time, all right? But the thing is, he still walked down through that mall, and that still happened. Why? Is it because he had a bad spiritual life? At that time, he was, had the best spiritual life of any little kid I knew, and today, he still has the best spiritual life of any man anywhere, including me, all right? So uh, he's always been that way, but that still happened we need to recognize that it's not a reflection of our spiritual life that we can draw sexual gratification. It's a reflection of our maleness. Number three, we need to understand this very clearly. Our eyes can perform foreplay, sexual foreplay. Think of what the scientists said, okay? We look at something sexual, chemicals are released. The same thing that happens when we're actually having sex with a woman. Okay, we think about Jesus Christ um, standing in Galilee and saying, hey, you know, I say it's not just adultery that matters, physical adultery. I say that when you look at someone to lust after them, that's adultery. <laughs> you look at the science, he was right. He probably knew the science, okay, because he made us, right? Okay, but he's absolutely right. Looking and lusting is the exact same thing because the exact same chemistry happens in your brain and you're getting the same kind of a high. So we don't just believe Jesus because of that. We also can see it in science. But it becomes a big issue, the fact that we can have that genuine sexual gratification going on through our eyes in this way. Um, I was talking to a young man named Alex one time, and this is what he said. He said he was sitting in, his, um, in the family room at his mother-in-law's house. Everyone else had gone shopping except his sister-in-law. There was a television and there was an easy chair, and uh, he was looking at the television, and she was right in line with the television. She was just laying on the floor watching TV like this. He was sitting in the chair. Well, after a while, she fell asleep. And when he looked down to look at her, uh, he saw that there was a little piece of her underwear kind of sticking out from underneath her shorts. Well, that was a little exciting, uh, but he turned away. Oh, it's my sister-in-law. I shouldn't look at that. But then, you know, it was pleasurable, so he looked back, and then he looked away. But pretty soon, it got more and more intense until he was sitting in his chair looking at that piece of underwear, looking at her rear end, masturbating right there. Okay? That really paints the picture of what I mean by foreplay. He didn't have to touch her. He didn't have to stroke her breast. He didn't have to stroke her thigh. His eyes alone could get his engine running so high uh, that he either had to have release or explode. His engines were going to explode. Okay? And so we need to understand that when we say our eyes can draw true sexual gratification, they really can. And it's the exact same thing. We also know, I mean, if you're anything like me, I mean, I remember when I would go to Stanford's drugstore and it was, oh, a new magazine this month. I mean, before I even would get to the drugstore, I've been thinking so much about, oh, how neat the new pictures will be. I mean, I'm, my sexual engines are through the roof before I even get the thing in my hand. So the eyes work that way and the mind works that way. We can have, we can do foreplay in our minds. And most of us who are hooked on sexual sin, I share those stories. You can quickly come up with five stories of your own in your own life, and you, yes, yes, I understand how the eyes work. Number four, as men then, we are set up to fall into sexual sin by nature. I mean, we are set up for it. And our father's silence, our pastor's silence on this issue dooms us into a long, hard slide. What would have happened to Michael had I not been there for Brenda to send him down to talk to me? 
Well, shoot, the next time he goes to the mall, he'd have looked into that window to see if it would have happened again. Next time he goes to the mall, he might have looked into the J. Crew window instead, and I wonder if it works this way here. And then he might notice the next time he's watching TV and there's kind of something racy or some kind of commercial, oh, wow, I can't get that out of my mind now. And he starts maybe just being curious, and before long, it's an ongoing thing in his life. And that's the way it works for us, and that's why it's so important for us to talk about this on a regular basis, for our pastors not to ignore it, but to press in on it. How foolish it is for a pastor to say, we don't have these issues in our church. Okay, so are you, are you an all-female church? I mean, because if you've got men in your church, they got those eyeballs, and you've got the problem. Okay, and there's no, there's no other way around it. If you've got men in your church, you've got this issue, and you really need to understand that and press forward with it. The other thing is dads. You can't just say, well, he's probably not old enough, and I'll get to this maybe when he's 17 or 18. Dead. He's dead already. Because he's the average Christian, the average boy in America sees his first porn at age 11. That's an average. Half of them see it even earlier. If you're not talking about these things, guess what's going to happen? Their eyes are going to do what they do, and they're going to slide into problems. So you can either be heroic and step into this milieu and fix it and help him like you're going to help yourself, or you just let him slide into prison like you are. And that's how it is. Now, the ability of the male eye to draw sexual gratification from the world is simply a way of life for guys. It's just simply part of life for us, okay? With all this foreplay going on with the eyes and no guidance for our sons, no guidance for us, the result is understandable. You know, we always ask the question, why are so many Christian men hooked? <laughs> well, it's because we live in a sensual culture and nobody's ever talked to us about it. Our dads haven't talked to us about it. Our pastors haven't talked to us about it. And the way we're built, of course, it's going to be like this. However, we can change that. We don't have to keep doing it that way. I have two sons, and I've talked to them extensively about this. My first son got all the way to the wedding altar, never kissed a girl, never masturbated, went into uh, marriage pure. My other son, he's 21, walk in that same path. And why? It's because I just talked to them. I didn't say, oh, you know, this is a moral issue and ooh, it's scary. Uh, it's not completely a moral issue. It's a physical issue that our young men need to learn how to deal with. Look, I get emails from men. They're 52. They're 56. They're saying, I read your book and I'm finally free. They've lived their whole lives like this. Okay, and the point I want to make with that is every man on the planet at some point has to take his sexuality and deal with it. It's, he either has to own it or it owns him. And it's not a big issue. It's not a scary issue. It's not a, ooh, can't talk about that. There might be women in the audience, okay? It's just a fact of life. We are men. We need to control it. You either learn to control it when you're 11, like my son Jason, or you learn to control it when you're 30, like me, or you learn to control it when you're 52, like these other guys. But if you're ever going to have oneness with God and really have the kind of life with Him that you want, that is just part of the process of moving from purity into adulthood. And we need to talk to our sons about it. Now, what does this thing about the eyes being able to perform foreplay, what does this mean for us? Okay. It means that the means to sin, the ability to sin, actually lies within us. Okay. That's what makes this sin so different. Our eyes, we can look at a exercise show and get all excited. Um, you know, we can think about Hustler magazine and get all excited. I mean, this sin is different from other sins. Okay, let's go back to my um, let's go back to the pizza story, all right? Um, when I made the decision that I'm not going to drink beer anymore, what did I have to do? I simply had to stop going to the store and buying it, okay? Um, I had to stay out of the aisle, and I had to keep it out of my house. The 
fact of the matter is, is that sin or that means to sin, that bottle of beer, is outside of me. I, it's just out there. I just need to stay away from it, okay? And that is how most sins are. Paul talked about sins in 1 Corinthians 6.18, okay? And he made a clear distinction between all other sins and this sin. And this is what he said. All other sins a man commits are outside his body. But he who sins sexually sins against his own body or through the means of his body. Okay? The beer was outside my body. Okay? Now here we are. Let me tell you another story that from another guy that I talked to at the altar after a, a speaking engagement and this is what he said to me. He said, Fred, I have been praying that God would take away my lust problem. And he said, I went to the altar, and he actually did. He said, I was standing there, and I saw this veil, kind of like a wedding veil, just kind of floating down from, from the ceiling. And I, I felt it come down and fall across my shoulders. And the moment it crossed my shoulders, I felt all my lust go away. And of course, all of us say, can I sign up for that experience, okay? That's a good experience. And I said, wow, you are so fortunate. I don't hear anything like that. And he said, no, 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 listen. Listen to the end of the story. He said, for the next six months, I did not look at porn, I didn't masturbate, I didn't do anything. He said I was just completely lined up with how I needed to be and wanted to be. But then it was summer. And I had gone out to lunch one day, and I was coming back to my office, and I was just standing there waiting for the light to change. And I looked across the street, and I saw a girl with a very tight halter top, and she was flowing out all over the place. And he said, it was unbelievable. So the light changed, and as she walked, I couldn't keep my eyes off her chest. And then when she went by me, I, I found myself turning to look at her, and, and even when I turned to walk towards my office, I noticed she was walking the same direction on the other side of the street, and I kept looking at her. By the time I got up at my office, oh man, I was just really feeling excited, and he said, you know, God has freed me from my lust, so it probably won't hurt anything for me to pull up a little porn and look at it to calm down. Okay. So we've looked at the science of this, okay? Does looking at more porn calm anything down? No, it's like saying, could you please cool the fire a little bit? Here's a can of gasoline. Could you just cool down the campfire a little bit? It's too high. <laughs> okay, it's everywhere. So he looked at a little porn, and he said a few days later he looked a little more, and within three weeks he was as hooked on sexual sin as he had ever been in his entire life. And this is what he said to me. He said, what you said about setting up defenses and becoming self-disciplined, uh, that is the key to freedom. Yeah, God freed me in a moment, but that's not enough. I needed to have defenses in place. I needed to have character change in place so that I could defend myself from new sewage coming into my life. Okay? And the reason why that's necessary is simple. This sin is different. I can't tell you how many times guys have said words like this to me. You know, I got saved and the drinking fell away, the smoking fell away, the drugs fell away, but the one thing that didn't fall away was my sexual sin. I don't understand that. We've just looked at the science, we've just looked at scripture. It's because the means to sin is right here and we can't get rid of it. We can't pull it out and throw it away. And so, wherever we go, it's with us. Okay? We can walk away from drugs, we can walk away from alcohol, we can walk away from cigarettes, we can walk away from anything we want to walk away from, but not these. And so, it comes down to a simple truth. You either defend your eyes or you have sexual sin. Because you can't get rid of your eyes, you can't walk away from them, so there's only one answer. You either defend them or you don't, and if you don't, you're dead. And guys can say, well, I want to defend them a little bit, um, but I don't want to go as far as you're talking about. Fine, stay in sexual sin. I mean, that's your choice. Uh, we all have that choice, but you're not getting free if you don't set up defenses. You're just not. 
because this is our main vulnerability in our sexuality, and this is the one Satan uses constantly. He doesn't have to do a thing. He just laughs and watches you slide on in. All right? So when we talk about this, let's go through a few arguments that we often use. We will say, okay, I understand what you're saying, but I'm mature enough to watch these things. I've been a Christian a long time, and I'm mature enough to watch and look at these sorts of things without getting any real difficulty in my life. Okay. Let me rephrase that question for you. What if somebody came up to you and said, um, I'm mature enough to shoot heroin and not get high? See? You laugh your head off. You idiot. What are you talking about? Okay, why? <laughs> they put the drug in their bloodstream. They're going to get high. What are they talking about? It has nothing to do with maturity, right? Okay, now let's talk about what Jeffrey Satinover said, that the actual chemical reactions in the brain between porn addiction and heroin addiction are the same. It's nothing to do with maturity. If you look at a woman in a tight halter top and she's hanging out all over, what is going to be happening in your brain? Chemistry. Pleasure chemicals are going to dump. And you can't stop it. You either look at her or you don't. Okay? So it has nothing to do with maturity. When you say to yourself, I'm mature enough to watch this already movie, I wouldn't let my kids watch it, but I, I'm mature enough. Um, that doesn't make any sense, biblically, science, on any level. All right? Um, if you think for five minutes that you can watch the same shows as the non-Christians can and somehow get a different result because you've got the Holy Spirit in you, you're crazy. You're absolutely crazy. What if somebody said this to you? I have been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. And actually, on this last 40th day, I've been praying for 23 and a half hours straight in intercession, complete on my face, okay? Now, I'm going to take this syringe of heroin and I'm going to stick it in my arm. And because I'm so spiritually mature right now, I'm just so full of God, nothing's going to happen. What would you say to him? <laughs> well, I'm going to be watching. <laughs> okay? Because the second he sticks that in, he's going to get high. All right? It doesn't matter how super strong you think you are spiritually. Your eyes do what your eyes do and you need to defend it. And there's no other answer behind that. Uh, and, and you can say what you want. And see, a lot of guys will say, well, I, you know, I've watched these movies a long time, and you know, bare breasts, they really don't do anything for me. <laughs> okay, they're desensitized is all. I remember my brother-in-law, um, he was going through a divorce, going through a really hard time, and he, he just began to start watching uh, not watching television at all, just spending all of his time in prayer and just really digging in. Well, the whole thing collapsed. He ended up in divorce, and he began to watch television again. <laughs> the same shows he was used to watching before. He was absolutely flabbergasted and blown away. What in the world? How sensual and sexual it is. And yet when he was watching it before, he didn't notice. Okay? Because there's a desensitization that happens when we're watching those things over time. But what is happening chemistry? Does that mean that he's looking at those breasts and nothing's happening, happening chemistry-wise? No. You're desensitized. You're not being shocked by it on any level, but it's still going on. You need to recognize the truth of this if you're expecting to win. And some people would say, well, but it's so legalistic. And I would say to you, okay, if you're trying to get a guy off a of heroin addiction, is it legalistic to say, no more heroin? No. Because you know the only way you're going to get to the root issues underneath it is to get him off the heroin so you can get to the root issues. And it's the same thing with sexual sin. You've got to get us off our drugs before you can get to the issues that are underlying why we run to sexual sin in the first place. The fact of the matter is there's nothing legalistic about it. It's no more legalistic for me to say to my son, stay away from Britney Spears' videos than it is to say to my son, stay out of Interstate 80 so you don't get run over. Okay, is that legalistic? You're putting rules down for my son, you can't play in Interstate 80. Oh, what a mean legalistic dad. 
I know what's going to happen to him if I say, look at this porn or look at Britney Spears videos. I know what's going to happen. He's going to get hooked. And that's just the way it is because that's the way his eyes are made. And so we need to get past all this stuff. Of, oh, I'm afraid I'll be a Puritan. Oh, nothing wrong with being a Puritan if it lines up with Christ. Nothing wrong with being moral if it lines up with the word. We get so bound up with, oh, you might be a Puritan and everybody will laugh at you. Look, do you want to be free from sexual sin or not? I don't care if somebody calls me a Puritan. It's been over 20 years since I've had sexual sin in my life. I'm happy and I'm going to stay happy and nobody's going to change that. And they can laugh at me all the way to heaven. I don't care one bit about it. And we need to be men about this. What men do is they assess a situation they make the decisions necessary to deal with it, and then they work that through, and they stand on the other side going, victorious. That's what men do. We're, we're built to fight great battles. We're built to live great adventures. And I gotta tell you something, I've, I've won a lot of great battles. Might be a little to you, but I mean, I won every inner city game against all of our football opposition, and I loved it, okay? And there's a lot of victory I've had in my life in sports, in business, everything else. But I gotta tell you something. There's been no battle, no great adventure that's been anything like this one. I mean to tell you, to take on Satan and to take on sexual sin that's built right into me and to win, if you wanna have a life that feels fulfilled, take this on and win. On the other side of this, You'll feel so heroic and like such a man, and you know I can stand shoulder to shoulder with any man in this nation. They might be able to beat me up, but they can't win like I can win. You see what I'm saying? And that's what men thrill to. We thrill to living great adventures and fighting great battles. And the third thing is protecting the damsel in distress. Every great movie has that. Every great life has that. I have to tell you something. If you talk to my wife and you were to ask her the question, okay, what's it like having Fred sexually pure? What does it mean to you? <laughs> it means I'm always safe. That's one of the first things that comes in, out of her mouth. The second thing is he has earned the right to lead this family. Okay. <laughs> you think I like that? I love that. I want to be a heroic leader in my home. And that's what God's called me to. And she's my damsel. And, I, and when I'm in sexual sin, she's in distress. And the only way to save her is, a, is to knock it off and to step up and win that battle. It's difficult to touch on everything uh, that you have to do to win this battle. It's not a complex battle. It's just a, a focused battle. Okay, you know where the enemy is, you know what needs to be defended, so you put up your defenses and then you win. But there are a number of things that you need to do. And uh, in the book, Every Man's Battle for Married Guys and in the Every Young Man's Battle for uh, Single Guys, I talk about building these defenses in detail. And I'm talking practical. Um, by the time you lay down a book like that, you know exactly what to do. And so, what I've tried to do is, is put enough detail there that everybody would be able to handle it. What I talk about in the book Every Man's Battle is a concept called bouncing your eyes because by nature, and you've noticed this in your own life, you by nature are built to look at the sensual thing in your line of sight. I mean, if you're walking down the street and there's a girl in a bikini over there, you're looking. I mean, your eyes are going to naturally go that way. It's just the way that we're built. I remember one time I was looking through a magazine with Brenda and it's just we still laugh at this a lot. It was just a good housekeeping magazine, all right? And so we're, we're just kind of flipping through it, and I don't even know why we were flipping through it. But we came to a page, and we both looked at it, and then she flipped it. And as she flipped it, I said, I hate it when they do that. And she's like, do what? And I said, well, I said, all that sensuality. There wasn't any sensuality there. We pulled it back. And see, there was this big cake and there were two female mannequin legs sticking out the top with fishnet stockings on them, okay? And it's just, you know, 
kind of, I don't know what the cake was for or anything like that. And I said, well, see, right there. She just burst out laughing. She said, I wouldn't have seen that in a million years. This is legs. This is just legs sticking out of there. Ah, no, no, no. Those are legs with fishnet stockings that are kind of up. And uh, she goes, and then we just flipped the pages and kept going. My point is, your eyes are going there, okay? And you're, it's just the way that we're built. And the fact is, is that we need to train our eyes to bounce away from those things so that, uh, you know, when it's flipped, you know, you look and you just bounce away. You can say, I hate that, but, I mean, your eyes are naturally bouncing away. Another story. We were on the beach one time. This is 15 years into purity, so uh, it was just very strange uh, for Brenda to ask me this, but she saw like a, probably a 90-year-old woman on the beach wearing a really <laughs> skimpy bikini, okay? And I mean, she might have been 95. I mean, she was a real raisin prune and uh, lots of wrinkles. And uh, so uh, Brenda says, oh, you've got to see this, Fred. You've got to look at this. I said, ah, I don't want to. She's in a bikini. Uh, no, 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 it's okay, but she's 95. It's okay, You're, it's just gonna be okay, but you've got to see this. An interesting thing happened. I tried to look and I couldn't. I mean, my defenses were so strong by that point in my life that I actually had to force myself to look at a, you know, a bikini, where in the old days it just naturally bounced that way. And I tell you that story because you need to understand that once you put the defenses into place, you begin to really live this. It doesn't stay a big fight anymore. It becomes habit, and, and you actually have to make yourself look over time. And I know a lot of guys go, oh, sure, Fred. Listen, if you do this, it will happen that way. I promise you it'll happen this way. So anyway, yeah, you're probably waiting for the end of the story. I looked and, ah, oh, I mean, I gagged. But uh, so, I mean, that was less of the point of the story. The point of the story is just that you can get to the point where these defenses are, are locked into place. Now, when we talk about bouncing the eyes, it's based upon Job 31.1. I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a girl. And we know that Job was considered blameless and perfect. So we know that God was pleased with the fact that he had done this in his life, all right? Now, how do you do this? Now, the first thing I did uh, when I wanted to get my eyes under control is I picked the six things in my life that were the biggest traps for me. I've already talked to you before about the fact that looking at lingerie ads and the Sunday morning ad insert, that was deadly for me. And that was the worst one for me to get rid of. I mean, I had to set up all sorts of rules. To give you an idea of some of the rules, um, if I reached for that ad insert, like say a Target store ad insert, which is definitely always going to have lingerie ads in it, um, if I had any sense in me that I was picking that up because there's lingerie in that, I forfeited my right to look at it for that week. Okay. Now see, sometimes you look at these um, ad inserts because maybe, say it's a Sears ad or something like that, where there might be a tire sale or tool sale on the back few pages because the guy stuff is always on the back okay so you're you're looking oh, I need new tires maybe I'll look whatever okay but the thing is the lingerie ads are always on page three and four okay because they're just inside the front and so you can actually pick up a lingerie ad and just open it from the back and you never have to worry about seeing the lingerie ads because you're just seeing the guy stuff so that was another rule uh, if I would pick up the lingerie ad and open it from the front instead of the back I forfeit my right to look at it that week and I just have to throw it away um, uh, so I set up a number of rules like that that would allow me to still look at those ads if I needed something but I mean complete and and then I just lose the chance to save money that week. I mean, sorry, you can't look. And uh, that still was hard because I still had to have the discipline to throw that away even when I broke one of those rules. But the rules enabled me to put a fence around that where I understood where I could go and where I couldn't go. And it helped me to, to develop self-discipline. Now, another thing that I struggled with, I was a salesman. And uh, when you walk into a place to uh, make a sales call, you'll usually have a receptionist there, and they're usually dressed very sensually because the company says, hey, we want you to have a good first impression on, on all the people that come in. And I always say, yeah, we want you to have a good sexual impression on, on anybody that comes in because a lot of times it's that way. And um, so a lot of times when they would like, ring up somebody that I wanted to see, she would bend over maybe to do the switchboard and her shirt would fall open. 
And in, my, in the old days, I go, it's my lucky day. I get a nice view of her breasts cupped in those bras. And, um, but, you know, obviously, when you're trying to get away from sexual sin, that's obviously out of bounds. And so, um, and then sometimes they'll walk back to maybe a file cabinet, and they'll bend over, and you'll see this nice view of their rear and their nice little sensual clothes they're wearing. And so what I had to do there was I had to set up some rules. Okay, when she starts to bend over, I bounce my eyes away. Not after she bends over, but the moment you see her bending over, you turn your eyes away. The moment she's walking towards a cabinet, you turn your eyes away. Now, nobody else sees that I'm doing that. Okay, if anybody is watching me, um, they're just going, oh, okay, he looked over there at something. I mean, so it's not like you have to go, oh my heavens! Uh, you don't have to be embarrassing. You don't have to make a big deal out of it. You just look away. And that becomes habit over time where, you know, and then, you know, when any girl is in your space and, you know, she starts to bend, you tend to turn your eyes away. And I don't want to look at your wife's bottom. I don't want to look at your wife's bottom. I don't want to look at anybody's bottom. I want to look at Brenda's, okay? When she bends over, I'm looking. But that's it. You see what I'm saying? And I don't have a right to your wife's rear end. I don't have a right to look. Um, so I need to defend you. I need to defend me. All right. So those are some practical ways to do it. Now, let's talk about star, and you can get more of that from the books, but it was about starving the mind. How do we starve the mind? I mean, we know we can lust. We can draw up pictures from the old days and lust over them. Well, there's all sorts of things. We can bring up uh, scenes from old girlfriends dating them or whatever. We can lust. We can do anything we want, okay? The Bible says that we're to take those thoughts captive. 2 Corinthians 10.5 says this, We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it what? Obedient to Christ, all right? Now, for me, taking thoughts captive was not a, I mean, let's say somebody calls you a natural athlete, okay? That probably means you're fast and you can jump and you're not fall down, okay? With this, I wasn't a natural capturer. I mean, I didn't find it, I'm not a natural athlete when it comes to catch, capturing thoughts at all. And, but I did find that even though I couldn't capture a thought, that I could replace a thought. That's one thing I could do. Uh, so I thought, well, this is the closest thing I can get to. Maybe I'll learn how to capture a thought one day. So what I decided to do, I was having a real trouble, a real issue with an old girlfriend. And Brenda and I were having troubles in our first couple of years of marriage and just a lot of problems. And so I would find myself thinking about my old girlfriend saying things like, oh, well, if I'd have married her, I wouldn't have these problems, that sort of thing. One day, God just broke into my thoughts, and he said, uh, by the way, you have no right to think about that girl ever again, ever. And uh, I wrestled with him for like 30 seconds, and then he pinned me, and that was it. And so I said, well, God, I had to figure out a way to replace these thoughts. So this is what I did. I. Um, I actually memorized 50 hymns, uh, all four verses of 50 hymns, and because I wanted to be like the United States of America and have way more nuclear weapons than I could ever possibly use. And um, so what would happen is if thoughts of this girl would come into my mind, my rule was I needed to sing a hymn. So I just, okay, uh, hymn one, verse one, I would sing it. And I'd be singing it to myself if I'm out in public, obviously. and. Um, and if I would get to the end of that verse and she was still in there, <laughs> verse two. And sometimes five hymns, you know, it would be 20 verses later before, you know, she's out of my head, okay? And the thing that happened with that is that over time, the partial control that comes from learning to replace thoughts grew into the ability to actually capture thoughts. Today, if a thought of her comes to my head, I can just take it and toss it out without singing a hymn. So, boop gone. And what we need to understand is what God said to us in Thessalonians. We need to learn to control our body. I first learned how to re control my brain by replacing thoughts, and then it grew into being able to take thoughts captive. Now, it doesn't have to be spiritual things. I mean, you could memorize a bunch of scriptures and throw them at it, uh, or hymns, and pound it to death with 50 hymns, okay? But, I mean, I got an email from a guy. He wasn't using 
wasn't using like hymns or scriptures, but he was replacing thoughts. Listen to this guy. I just love this guy. He said, I've been assailed by sexual sin every, ever since puberty, but now I'm using the tools you taught me about replacing thoughts, and I've come up with my own ideas. When my mind is hit by a temptation, I escape by simply bombarding my mind with tons of different thoughts until I simply forget about the original temptation. Now listen to what he does. He says, I drop a sort of cluster bomb on the situation and begin to think of all the other things in a string, like this. What are all the major assault rifles of the world and their caliber? What is my grandmother's maiden name and how many letters are in it? What is the definition of the word, word? What are the reasons I don't want to participate in the sport of skateboarding? What's up with that whole interpretive dance thing anyway? Okay. So he's just thinking these thoughts through and he says this, this is particularly useful since guys tend to only be able to focus on one thing at a time, but also, uh, but also have the habit of moving quickly from one thing to another. I have found that I often forget what I was being tempted about and continue with my day after this. My dad used the same process when he quit smoking cold turkey years ago. He would just focus on a hubcap of a moving car or watch one blade of a ceiling fan, forgetting the temptation for a minute or two until the cravings passed. Now, isn't that interesting? He's learning to replace thoughts and it's comical. I don't even know what one assault rifle is or its caliber. I mean, I don't, even, I don't know, he's just picking things he knows. But this, I want you to understand this. He stopped seeing his sexuality as a curse. And the discipline he's learned will help him protect every girl he ever dates. All right? He's become more than ever, he's become more than he ever dreamed possible. And see, that's the idea of living the great adventure and winning this battle. Okay? Because of your maleness, it may be natural to look and to think about whatever you want to look at and think about when it comes to sex and women, but you're not called to live on the natural plane. You are called to live on the supernatural plane, in the divine nature. Okay, his divine power was given us so that you'd have everything you need for life and godliness so that you may participate in the divine nature. Okay, so you need to understand that you can do that, and what you do is you need to learn how the body works and then make the adjustments necessary. When I find out that the eyes can do what they do, I made the adjustments necessary so that I don't slide down into sexual sin. When Michael comes to me and says, I can't get those pictures out of my mind, I teach him how the eyes work. And next time, this is what you do. You look at it and you bounce your eyes away. And he just says to me, Oh, that makes sense. And he's been doing it ever since. I can tell you so many stories about him and me. I'll to kind of finish with this one story. Um, I remember one time we were lifting weights, and we, we choose our health clubs based upon what we know about our minds. I mean, we always pick the one that's really ugly with a lot of cement and smelly stuff so that women don't come. All right? So and we, use, we go to a place with an old, uh, uh, old weight room with free weights and you know women like machines and so you know we're usually in a place where we don't have to deal with women we don't have to deal with what they're wearing or not wearing but one day three teenagers come in and they were all wearing wife beater shirts really tight around their breasts and uh, these really tight tank tops and, and it's just like everybody in there just like all the guys are just like whoa and uh, I looked at Michael and he wasn't looking at him and uh, I wasn't looking at him but we were look I was looking at the other guys and their eyes were just like this it's crazy and they're just in there they don't know how to lift weights they're giggling just goofing around and uh, then they left and we didn't say a word about it while we were in there so as we left later after we were done lifting weights Michael uh, is walking behind me by a step and a half, and I hear him behind me say, Dad, I don't think girls should be allowed to lift weights. <laughs> I knew exactly where he was going. And uh, I said, well, I know what you mean, son. And he said, no, I, it's not like they shouldn't lift weights. It's just, I said, it's because of what they were wearing, right? And he said, yeah, how'd you know? <laughs> Same eyeballs. And I said, you know, let me tell you, son, I mean, it's, that's just part of being in this world. And he said, but don't they understand what they do to us when they wear clothes like that? And I said, son, it really doesn't matter, I found, whether they understand what they're doing to us, okay? What matters is what we do 
when they walk into the room dressed like that. So I said, this is what we're going to do. Next time something like that happens, uh, they come in. Uh, when it's my turn to lift weights, I'll lift and focus on lifting and you keep your back to them. Because this is what I found in life, son, that you cannot lust through your peripheral vision. It's impossible. So as long as you keep track of them through your peripheral vision and just kind of keep your back to them and I'll lift and then when it's your turn, I'll keep my back to them, peripheral vision, everything will be fine. Oh, okay, we'll do that. So we get into the car, dead silence, okay? Because this is heavy for a young guy to ask his dad about stuff like this. So it's dead silence, but he's thinking. I mean, you can hear the gears going. And so we're halfway home. It's about a 15 minute drive, so about eight minutes later, he says, Dad, I'm really, really glad that you told me about this peripheral vision thing. I'd have never thought of that on my own. You see, we need to share what's working. We need to share our defenses, why they work, and we need to learn so that we can all walk as warriors in this world, victorious, winning our battles, defending our brides, defending our homes, like real men do. And um, I just encourage you, now that you understand more about how the eyes work and how the brain works, I encourage you to rise up, put the defenses in place, make the changes necessary, and be the hero that God has called you to be as a Christian man in a sensual culture.